Good afternoon, dearest viewers, and welcome back to another Facebook Live session at Carol Fertility Center. My name is Emma, and together with me today would be um, Dr. Ratinka, who is a consultant anesthetist. So, hi, Doctor. Hello, Emma. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, maybe to give our viewers a bit of background, um, maybe you could briefly introduce yourself to our viewers. I'm Dr. Ratika Marutu and I work as the consultant and aesthetist in Kiala Fertility Center. Mm -hmm. um, graduated my undergraduate uh, medical degree from the Kasturba Medical College in uh, India, after mm -hmm. which I finished my master's program in uh, anesthesiology and critical care from the University of Malaysia uh, in year 2006. Mm -hmm. uh, went on to work in various hospitals doing uh, anesthesiology, critical care, and I've been with KL Fertility Center the last two years. Mm, I see, that's great. So how do you like it so far? Uh, working here has been very pleasant, yeah. it's uh, nice, okay. and uh, we, uh, yes, very interesting. <laughs> cool, great. So um, maybe before we dive into the topic of the day, I would just like to remind our viewers, um, should you have any questions or any concerns whatsoever, um, all you have to do is just pop them into the comment box below and uh, Dr. Ratinga will be more than happy to address them. Um, if you are shy about popping them into the comment box, you can also PM us on our page, um, Care for the Lady Center. Right, so today uh, we'll be discussing about anesthesia in IVF, uh, the importance and safety for patients. But uh, first things first, we should know why patients need anesthesia during the IVF. Okay, uh, why, do we, why do patients need anesthesia for any procedures or surgeries that you want? What does anesthesia mean? It actually means uh, there's a temporary loss of sensation, actually it's derived from a Greek word, right? So what happens when they come for any procedures or surgeries, there's no sensation of pain, which is the most important thing which the patients must not, must not feel. Mm -hmm. Secondly, there's a temporary loss of consciousness, mm -hmm. so that they will be at comfort and they will be less anxious. Mm -hmm. And this also enables the surgeon to do his procedure easier. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, he, so it benefits both sides, the patients and the, consult, the consultant will be doing the procedure or the surgery. Mm -hmm. So this makes it more comfortable. Mm -hmm. So eventually the patient will also be going home pain free. So this is the main uh, reason why we keep anesthesia to patients coming in. Right, I see. So what kind of uh, what type of anesthesia will patients? Okay, we have various types of anesthesia. Mm -hmm. uh, we have general anesthesia. We have local anesthesia. We have regional. We have sedation. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I will tell you all a briefly a little bit of each type of anesthesia. Sure. General anesthesia is when the patient goes to sleep and there will be pain free and this usually is done for procedures or surgeries which are long mm -hmm. take, taking more than an hour or so and uh, done when there's a surgery to the brain to the abdominal uh, or to the chest mm -hmm. okay and the second one is local local is means it only numbs that particular area so if you want to do a nail avulsion for example we just numb the, the toe or the, the, the nail part, the part around that nail. Mm -hmm. uh, regional is, we you would have heard like spinal anesthesia epidural, we do it when mm -hmm. very commonly done for caesarean sections, where the local anesthetic, is, which is actually injected into the spinal fluid, right. okay. and it numbs half the body from waist downwards. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, with regional anesthesia, you also have upper lip, uh, uh, anesthesia to the arm where you can just numb the arm or just numb uh, either your right or your left arm uh, and the last is sedation is what we commonly used in care of fertility mm -hmm. sedation also will make you unconscious but the um, we do not use drugs which actually paralyze the muscles mm -hmm. so you'll be very much breathing on your own the patients will be breathing on your own and they will be just very comfortable uh, going unconscious like going into a deep sleep mm -hmm. without pain so that is the most common uh, uh, way of anesthetizing patients in care of fertility. I see. Okay, so maybe just summarize that um, care of fertility, the type of anesthesia that um, yes, sedation to... with uh, monitored sedation it is mm -hmm. called actually. I see. Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Now, um, is there a different level of anesthesia that patients will receive? Yes. Mm. When a patient comes in for anesthesia, they actually have different levels. Right. Uh, uh, Actually, anesthesia itself is graded into different levels. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I will not go too in detail. But I will tell the tell you all what actually the level, what happens mm -hmm. 
So when the patient is pushed into the operating theatre, right. into the operating room actually, mm -hmm. all right. So the anaesthetist will usually have an intravenous line okay. set. Okay, it's a cannula, which I'm sure you all have done. You know what it is, okay? And the anaesthesia is given via that. Okay, it's uh, intravenous. That means drugs which are pushed through these fingers. Mm -hmm. Okay. And from the time the patient comes, the drugs gets into their body until they become unconscious is, you can say it's level one. Level one. Okay. Okay. And then there'll be a second level where the patient will become unconscious, there'll be a loss of eye reflexes, mm -hmm. especially the eyelash reflex. And then when they go deeper into anesthesia, they will lose reflexes of the eyeball movement, then you will slowly lose your laryngeal reflex, which is your throat swallowing reflex. Okay. Right. And the final thing is actually when you actually can stop breathing. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, so, yeah, so these are the different levels of anesthesia, mm -hmm. which is generally for any type of anesthesia, general anesthesia and for sedation. Sure. Alright, okay. okay. Shall I, I, what I want to highlight here is what happens in sedation is the patient will be in a plane where there is no uh, reaction when there is a painful stimulus which is given. Mm. Okay, uh, so that will be in level between level two to three, and sometimes they can even go to level four, they, where they will stop breathing. Mm. Okay, temporarily. Yes, tempor Everything is temporary. Okay. So it's the role of the anesthetist to actually uh, take care of the patient of mm. very closely, being monitored all the time mm. to give this temporary. Uh, uh, monitoring and then to reverse the patient back mm -hmm. to awake oh, after the end, after the mm -hmm. procedure is done. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. So uh, how do you reverse this? Do you okay. Uh, another. Uh, yes. If your if it's general anesthesia, and I mentioned earlier, there's a mus there's a muscle relaxant which is given. Mm -hmm. What the muscle relaxant does actually it paralyzes the muscle. So if there's an abdominal surgery and it's a big cut, mm -hmm. you know, you don't want the patient to be moving up and down yes. and the surgeons can't put in their scalpel, sure. you know, you know, so we give muscle relaxant. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do have drugs to reverse the muscle relaxant. Okay. That is for general anesthesia. In sedation, we do not give any muscle relaxant, so the patient is breathing very much on their own. Mm -hmm. And if they go to the fourth stage of anesthesia where they actually stop breathing, Actually, all we do is support a little bit, with, you know, we just sort of they tuck the patient's chin mm -hmm. uh, and they, without muscle relaxing, there's no worry of uh, stopping to breathe for a long time. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So there's no drug administered for the sedation? No, kind no, of no drug administered for sedation to be reversed back. Right, I see. Okay, great. Now, what are the type of risks um, that patients face once under anesthesia? Because okay. it, it, it sounds a bit daunting to be, you know, paralyzed or uh, temporarily not breathing. So. Me, okay, if mm -hmm. you want me, okay, I will speak mainly about what happens in KL fertility. Of course, okay, right. okay, sure. Okay, in KL fertility, most patients receive sedation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's no worry of muscle relaxant being used. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no muscle relaxant being used. So patient come in and they get sedated. Mm -hmm. Sedation is given by me. And I am there from the beginning till the patient is being sent out to the recovery room. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when the sedation is given, uh, there are a few parameters which are monitored all the time. Sure. Their heart rate, their blood pressure, and their pattern of breathing, mm -hmm. including their uh, oxygen. Uh, we call it oxygen saturation, the oxygenation of the patient. Mm -hmm. Okay. So all these are closely monitored before mainly throughout the operation and after the operation. Mm -hmm. okay. So the risks involved, if you ask me if it's a patient who's a healthy, very young patient coming in for this procedure of egg retrieval, which we normally give anesthesia to in care fertility, I would say it's fairly low. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have followed whatever, we have asked you all to do like fasting time, if you have no medical problems, if you are within the base, uh, fairly good weight, that is a BMI of less than 30, 30 to 35, mm -hmm. uh, you have no previous complications with your previous surgeries, mm -hmm. the risk involved is very, very low. Mm -hmm. okay. Of course, there is mild uh, side effects like you may have nausea, some may have vomiting, yeah. there's pain on injection of the drug. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a little bit of bruising that you put the needle in, mm -hmm. uh, and of course, 
with, as with any anesthesia, you will feel drowsiness, a bit of mm -hmm. headache. Sure. So just a little bit of side effects which you will be facing after a procedure done. Mm. So. Yeah, but those are pretty common. Um, yeah, so these are pretty common and I would say it's fairly low risk. Mm. So there's uh, okay. no a little temporary discomfort. Yes, yeah, discomfort. Yeah. Bruising, yes. nausea. Bruising. Yeah. Mm. Okay, great. Now, um, how long will patients be unconscious in terms of in, in okay. sedation? How long the patient will be unconscious is actually how long the surgeon wants the patient how long his procedure or her procedure is. Mm. In a retrievals, it's about 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Okay. okay. So, yeah, it's about half an hour. Mm. So, that is why we use sedation because mm. if it's going to be longer than an hour, we prefer to have general anesthesia. But in egg retrievals, on an average, it's 20 to 30 minutes. Mm. So, sedation yeah. works very fine for this procedure. Mm. I see. So, once um, eggs are already retrieved, during that period, uh, will the patient still be unconscious and then into the recovery room? Okay. And then um, when the patient comes in, mm -hmm. we immediately give the anesthetic drugs. Right. Okay. They go unconscious, mm -hmm. and yes, they'll be monitored so that they do not react to any painful stimulus. Yeah. Okay. Once the egg have been collected, towards the end, we'll be just cleaning of the uh, perineal area. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's no pain stimulus. It's just like wiping. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. at that point of time, we actually do not give any more drugs. Mm -hmm. So that five to ten minutes gives time for patient to come out of the anesthetic effect. Mm -hmm. But yes, they do. We do send them. They they are still drowsy. Right. Uh, they still may be half conscious, mm -hmm. but usually most of them will respond to my verbal. Stimulus. Hello, are you okay? Are you fine? And they said yes. Oh, it's finished. Okay. Okay. So then we transfer them to the recovery room, and then we keep them for another one to two hours. Okay. So again, I will make sure that I will see every patient after the procedure, and then I will decide whether they are ready to go. Fit to go. Home. Fit to go home. Yes. I see. So in this case, um, even though they are fit to go home, they still must have a guardian or a companion. Yes, that's very important yeah. because yes, they will come out of the anesthesia after one to two hours. But somehow, there is uh, still the very small part of the anesthesia which will be in them in the next 24 hours. Sure. So, yes, because it's a daycare surgery. Mm -hmm. okay, daycare surgery is where they come in the morning, they get their procedure done, and they go back home after, say, all in about 3 to 4 hours. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yes, they are not supposed to drive. Mm -hmm. They are not supposed to deal with heavy missionaries. In fact, they are not supposed to sign any legal documents. <laughs> Okay. For the next 24 hours, which I tell my patients, uh -huh. and they ask me why. I said, well, because to be safe by the next 24 hours, there's some lingering effects of the anesthesia still. Mm -hmm. So to be safe for the next 24 hours, you just go home, relax. I mean, you can go about your daily activities, but no driving, no heavy missionaries, no signing legal documents. Sure. And yes, you must have an adult to take you back home. Definitely no work as well, like normal office work, definitely that's a big thing. Yeah, you can go back home and do your work, but you know, mm. no no important decision making, right. no driving. Sure, sure. Okay, great. Now, um, what are some of the important um, information you as an anesthetist should know about the patient? Mm. Yes. Uh, number one, when the patients come to me, I will see them in the morning. Mm. If it's a day surgery, I will see them the day of the surgery. Right. Having said that, um, Sometimes I do see patients a week or two before the mm -hmm. planned procedure because they either are hypertensive or they have some medical problems. Mm -hmm. So usually the consultants will call me and say, okay, Dr. Radhika, I want to see this patient again. So that I am prepared to deal with them and they are also optimized for the procedure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is, yes, uh, their medical problems. Mm -hmm. Are they diabetic, hypertension, asthmatic? Are they all well controlled? What are the medications they are on? It's important, important to me. Okay. okay, so any endocrine problems, let it be a thyroid or any any medical issues which they have, I must know. Mm -hmm. So okay. that's important. Right. So the patients must tell me what medications they are on, mm -hmm. whether it's medications given by the hospital or any alternative medications. Right. All right. right. Number two, any previous, com if they have had a surgery, any previous complications with the surgery especially from the anesthetic side any anesthetic complications the family faced because sometimes there are certain genetic uh, conditions which affects our family okay. uh, like for example some months ago I had this lady who was from a particular uh, particular part of India where mm -hmm. the whole uh, 
the whole gene, they have a, they, their whole family lacks this enzyme. Okay. okay. So this enzyme, what happens when you lack that particular enzyme? When you do a when you use a certain muscle relaxant, they can't be reversed. Oh. They can't be reversed, so they will be paralyzed for longer time. Oh wow! Yeah. Okay, that's very important. Yes, that's very important. So the, this lady actually, what happened? Her husband went for a appendicectomy right. in India, and uh, he couldn't be reversed, so he was he had to be in the ICU. So they take days because that particular enzyme was absent. Okay. So of course, uh, Dr. Prashant then immediately called me. He said, you know, but I said no worries because we don't use muscle relaxant here. Sure. Yeah, but even then, I I was aware of this patient's problem. Mm -hmm. So okay. yes, so that's very important if your family. Uh, has any genetic or any anesthetic complications. Mm. Okay, right. that's good. So, All right. that and with that, of course, I need to know their fasting time. Mm. Fasting time includes food and water. It can be any clear fluid. Ideally, we do not allow uh, solid food for six hours. Six hours, okay. And clear fluid, generally, I mean, if you're coming for a morning procedure, I would say after 12 midnight, just be free of water and food. Mm. But sometimes your hypertensive medications or medications need to be taken with water. Mm -hmm. So what I will tell them is take it with sips of water, not glass of water, sips of water mm -hmm. at 6 o'clock. So at least you have the 2 hours before we start at 8. Right. So that sort of clears, clears off from the sure. stomach. Sure. Basically, we do not want a full stomach mm -hmm. when the patient comes for anesthesia. Okay. Okay. I see. What happens when? Patient coming with a full okay. stomach. When the patient comes with a full stomach, mm -hmm. as I said, when you go through different stages of anesthesia, you lose your reflexes. Uh, so the reflexes from the eye reflexes, you're going to lose your swallowing okay. reflexes. So yeah. what happens when we have a full stomach? Sometimes when you're lying flat, and furthermore we are put in a in a leg up position, mm -hmm. okay, as any gynecological procedure. You have your stomach pushing up, mm -hmm. and that will press on to your uh, foot tube, and you have possibility of your food or drink regurgitating into your breathing tube because mm -hmm. the breathing tube and the food tube is you know close by right. so when it goes into your breathing tube what you call is a condition where you can aspirate into your lungs mm -hmm. and you can have chemical pneumonitis where it is caused by food particles or uh, drink particles going into your lungs as causing us pneumonia so that is why we emphasize that no food and no drink is very, very important for patients who come in mm -hmm. for anesthesia. Whether it's a sedation or whether it's anything, yeah. yes, okay. they should come empty stomach. Right, so this this rule applies not only in the IVF um, industry but also in any yes, industry. In any, as long as they say mm -hmm. fast from midnight, you're coming in, you're going to get it done under anesthesia. Yes, you must pass. Mm. Okay, that includes water as well. Yes, that right. includes water as well. I mean, you can have water up to three hours before your procedure, but mm. not bottles of water, as I said, mm -hmm. sips of water. Okay. But generally, yes, try not to have anything after 12 midnight. Okay, sure, noted on that. So, um, aside, earlier we mentioned in IVF, um, egg retrieval, this process will require anesthesia. So, aside from egg retrieval, is there any other process that Yes, in uh, our center, yes, of course, majority, the egg retrievals compulsory, they all receive anesthesia. Other than that, we have patients who have anesthesia for embryo transfers. Okay. Uh, you must understand in this place, I mean, they all, they are, they are, they are all very highly stressed out. I mean, for many reasons, for many factors, mm. psychosocial factors. You know, you're coming in for infertility treatment, anxious level is very high. Mm -hmm. Okay, so some patients, yes, depending who the consultants decide, mm -hmm. they will say, okay, you know, we want uh, anesthesia for the patient having an embryo transfer as well. So, yeah, mm -hmm. so we give it for embryo transfer. Mm -hmm. Sometimes for intrauterine insemination, where the patients have a condition called vaginismus, mm -hmm. where they actually have difficulty, they, they, they just can't take any sort of penetration. Okay. So, yes, anesthesia is also provided for them. That mm, kind of cases. Right. Yes. So for these two cases, it's more because to calm them down. Yes, to calm them down, mm -hmm. and uh, it's not so painful, but more of to calm them down. Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. I see. I see. But it seems like um, the IVF anesthesia is mainly tra um, tra um, given to the women. Is there any time where it was given to the women? Yes, we yes. do anesthesia for males as well. I mean, they come in for the uh, um, sperm aspiration mm -hmm. from the duct. Right. Okay. It's called tisa. Okay. It's called as it's actually a testicular aspiration. Mm -hmm. It's quite painful. Right. Yeah. So we also give uh, anesthesia for the males here who come for the testicular aspiration, mm -hmm. and it's similarly done to the way the egg, egg retrievals. And but 
they will be higher paid so I do give higher pay to you know okay okay good to know that great now we actually have a live question here but we actually addressed that this uh, question already but anyway let's just repeat yeah. it one more time yeah so how many hours of class is required so okay if you're coming in for an egg retrieval in the morning I will tell all my patients fast from 12 midnight mm. which means you can have a light snack before going to sleep at 10 o'clock or 10 30 and after midnight preferably no food and no drink mm -hmm. unless of course there's exceptions where you need to take your medications mm -hmm. you can have it with sips of water at six in the morning six. and after six strictly no water and no food yeah okay yes yeah. there are a lot of um dr Ritiga leon mentioned there were some consequences to this um which is particles may go into your breathing tube which yes. ultimately goes into your lungs and may lead to further complications later yes. on yes yeah so um yes please do fast of your food your drink especially your drink as well um a lot i think a lot of people think that water especially plain water is okay actually it is yes, not right? it is not yes right. you must at least stop drinking two hours prior to any uh procedures or surgeries mm -hmm. water and those who come for embryo transfer actually sometimes yeah they because they're supposed to come with a full bladder mm -hmm. Uh, what I would say is drink as much water before 12 midnight so that you know when you come your bladder is full so mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about uh, drinking water just before your procedure because mm -hmm. actually by right it's not at all safe mm -hmm. if you have just drank a glass of water before mm -hmm. your procedure it's really not safe mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so okay. yeah okay cool now um, perhaps in your experience um, your vast experience is anesthesia um, industry has there been a time where in the IVF world, right? Um, a patient tells you that, um, doctor, I don't think I want to have. I, I don't think I want to. Yes, medical. I've had. Mm. I've had oh, patients that like, come in and say, uh, I don't want to sleep. I want to know what's happening right. throughout the procedure, <laughs> which is very rare. But mm. yes, I've had two or three patients. Right. Uh, so I said that's fine. What I will do then is because the pain from the egg retrieval is when the vaginal wall is punctured or the ovarian capsule is punctured. Mm. Okay, so what I will do, I will give them painkillers as I always do, but I do not give them the uh, the drug which will make them unconscious, right? Or I will give them very minimal, so they will actually be conscious. We call it conscious sedation, mm -hmm. and this conscious sedation is what is practiced very widely in in US and also in UK, right. all right? Because patients be the probably not so mm -hmm. fearful of anesthesia like how we are, sure. all right? Most patients which I come here, they say, I don't want to know anything, I want to be knocked out. So I do what they want. Okay. But the patients who don't want, want to be knocked out, I will decrease my mm -hmm. anesthetic drugs. I, I will give them the painkillers so mm -hmm. that they do not feel the pain. But they're actually conscious throughout the procedure, mm -hmm. so we can actually have a conversation with them. Oh, okay. So yeah. that they don't feel the yeah. pain. Yeah, so it's actually how much of the drug which I give. I see. So I tailor it according to their needs. Mm -hmm. So yes. definitely in this case, a communication with the doctor. Is very yes, important. some of them want that verbal communication. Mm. Okay. Or they will be just asleep. Mm -hmm. But when you actually tap them and say, are you okay? They say, yeah, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. you know, but they are actually just sleeping. But they are not totally knocked out. So there's still verbal communication mm -hmm. which can happen. I see. So I guess this is where the level, the different levels. Yes, this is the different, different levels which I was mentioning earlier. Uh, I see. Great. Okay. Now uh, we are actually coming to towards the end of our live session. Anyone have questions? No. Okay. Cool. Now, Doctor Matika, do you have any other advice you would like to give to our viewers in this? Aspect? Uh. Okay. Uh. Coming for any procedure or surgery is very, very uh, stressful. Mm -hmm. If you ask me, even if I had to go, <laughs> I would be stressful as well. Yeah. Something very normal. But uh, what I need to do is, need you all to do is just be, you know, take it as a step-by-step -step approach. Mm -hmm. If your plan, follow the orders which is given. Okay, what time to fast. Uh, you know, I think there are certain uh, orders given in our, there's a sheet which is always given out to our patients. Perfumes. Um, on my side, it's basically your fasting time. Mm -hmm. Okay, and please let me know whatever medications you all are on, or whether you've had any uh, previous complications with your surgeries, even anything as small as nausea or vomiting, because it can be very distressful for a patient to go home and having to vomit. Yeah. So at least it gives me a a startup to say, okay, I can because we do give anti emetics here, anti vomiting medications. So the main one I ask my patient, or oh, if you have very bad motion sickness, mm -hmm. 
this are the patients who will also have vomiting very easily after the medication. Oh, I see. All right. Okay. So just come out and tell me so I can cater to that individual needs of each patient. I see. Yeah. yeah. So if the patient says, "No, doctor, after every med uh, after anesthesia, I have very bad nausea or vomiting," I will give the medications during the procedure. I have very bad gastritis and medication. Mm. All that has to be highlighted to me. Okay, that's so, quite interesting because we would have never thought, I mean, me coming from a normal person's perspective, I would have never thought to tell my anesthesiast um, that I have motion sickness or I have gastric issues. Oh, you must yeah. tell, you must yeah. tell because uh, at the end of the day, you must understand when a patient comes to anesthesia, he must be comfortable mm -hmm. during the anesthesia and more importantly, he must be comfortable when he goes home sure. or he or she must be comfortable when they go home. Yeah. So you don't want to go home with the feeling of I'm still vomiting, I'm still having very severe gastritis, yeah. so I'm still having pain. That is my duty to make sure that when I discharge you from the recovery ward, mm -hmm. that you are comfortable enough to go home, walk and have a normal daily life, sure. not sitting in pain. So we, we, we give you an adequate pain relief. Mm -hmm. We actually check what is your pain level with our way of measuring. Mm -hmm. And we make sure all the parameters are normal, your blood pressure, your heart rate, your oxygen level in your body, right. your pain, mm -hmm. whether you are not vomiting anymore, you no more having nausea, we give them a light snack so that they go home mm -hmm. and they are not vomiting right. and also, uh, yeah, pain. Right. So, yeah. yeah, this is how I discharge my patients mm -hmm. and actually this is how everybody discharges their patients from the recovery ward. Yeah. After anesthesia, yeah, yes. that seems very comprehensive. You're not just um, in charge of the anesthetics only. Oh yeah, it is actually seeing the patient as a whole from beginning to beginning, during and after, after the yeah, even after they go home. Yes, yeah, okay, yeah. That's quite interesting. Great. Now, um, we have actually come to the end of our session. Now, again, if you have any other questions um, after this, no worries. You still can ask them. Um, again, do PM them in our Facebook page. Um, aside from that, again, thank you so much, Dr. Radiga, for being here. Thank you very much. Yeah, she's spending her time here, her knowledge. So, uh, we do hope that you have enjoyed this session. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.